A few weeks ago, I wrote a post about Tesco uh, Shopping Centre in the UK, and in particular about really easily observable uh, security risks, if you like, in the way they structured their shop. So lots of things around uh, passwords not being uh, encrypted in storage, or certainly not hashed in storage. Since then, they've said they're actually not encrypted either which is a bit of a worry. Lots of things like sessions uh, coming across in the clear, so sessions not protected over HTTPS. Uh, obviously passwords reminders being sent by plain text. All these sort of things were a real worry. And it's interesting because after I started uh, uh, raising this and I sent a little tweet to Tesco, I got the response you saw on the screen here, which was a little bit odd. Passwords are stored in a secure way. I only copied into plain text when pasted automatically into a password reminder mail. Now, to most people that have got a bit of a sense about uh, basic Web Security 101, that seems like a very bizarre thing to say. And as it turns out, a lot of other people thought it was a pretty bizarre thing to say as well. So at the time of writing, it's actually been retweeted uh, going on 1900 times. And a lot of people thought that this was a very uh, sort of odd thing. And the blog post got a lot of attention. It's had well over 100,000 views. And I've got a lot of emails from people saying, hey, you know, this is, um, this is not on. They've done the wrong thing. We've been letting them know for a long time they've done the wrong thing. And I also had some emails about vulnerabilities. And one of those vulnerabilities uh, actually sent me some information about some cross-site scripting, uh, which this person had found. So I thought the best thing to do with that was to send it privately on to Tesco and let them know that they had a serious problem. So about two and a half weeks back, I sent them a message and it was actually in response to someone who had reached out to me, someone from Tesco. So I asked for some technical contacts some people who could understand it. And I got another uh, couple of names and I sent all the information back. And unfortunately, uh, I didn't hear anything back. I sent on the original message with the cross-site scripting and I gave a bit of an explanation about why this might be a risk. So I didn't hear anything back. I followed them up about five days later. Uh, unfortunately, also didn't hear anything back. So I think the only thing you can sort of conclude from that is that they, they probably just weren't that interested. But putting Tesco aside for a moment, I think cross-site scripting in general is something that uh, people often don't really appreciate the severity of or the potential severity. They think that, hey, this is a way that we can get an alert box on a page and, you know, that's kind of cute, but what can you really do with it? Uh, so people don't seem to worry about it too much. So what I thought I'd do is a little bit of a demonstration about what you can do with cross-site scripting. So I have created uh, a bit of a dummy app. And what I want to do is use this dummy app to show some of the damage that can be done. Now, one of the things that I'm going to show is what we call reflected XSS. And reflected XSS is where uh, it is frequently exploited by sending a link around that has what we call an XSS payload in it, i.e. it's got some... A script which will be injected into a page when someone follows that link and the question then is okay well how do we get people to follow that link and one of the easy ways we can do that is we can obfuscate it so what you see here is a bitly URL which is obviously a shortened URL and I want to get people to follow this link so what I think I'm going to do is jump on over to Twitter and maybe just fire off a tweet and let's see if we can get some people to follow this link so what we might do is say something a little bit attractive. Let's see, got five sets free to help uh, demonstrate XSS risk to Tesco. I need some clicks and I also need to improve my spelling. So let's send that guy off and we'll see what happens now. While that's out there, uh, just one more thing on XSS, uh, about the potential severity of XSS. And what I wanted to uh, refer back to was probably one of the early examples of really serious XSS, which was uh, a worm on MySpace created by a guy called Sammy. And what Sammy managed to do was create a self-propagating XSS worm. And this XSS worm infected about a million people in around 20 hours on MySpace. Now, Sammy got himself into a whole heap of trouble for doing that as well, understandably. But I think it was a good demonstration of, hey, XSS can be a pretty uh, severe uh, security risk. And certainly since that time, browsers have done a lot of work to try and become more secure and to try and add better defenses to XSS, but we still have a lot of issues. So let's go and have a look at what is on the other end of that link. 
So this is my dummy app, my shop with robust security. And there's a whole bunch of content in here you can read later on. I will put the link uh, to this particular website, including XSS Payload, on the blog post that I'll attach this to. But I wanted to take a little bit of a moment to explain what has actually happened here. So this in theory would be a safe, uh, dare we say robust, secure website, not intended to do anything nasty. And what we've been able to do is send off a whole bunch of XSS in the query string which I'll explain in a moment. Now, what this XSS has done is it has taken all my cookies, or it's taken most of my cookies, I'll come back to the exception in a moment, and it has sent them off to an attacker. Now, you can't see this happen other than understanding what's in the query string, and we could easily obfuscate that further by encoding things more or by adding a whole bunch of other junk that looks a little, little bit more innocent at the start of the query string. But there's something else that happens in the background, and if we open up Fiddler and flick back and then we just reload this guy and go back to Fiddler, we will see that there is a request here off to Evil Shoplifting Site. And what is happening when it goes to Evil Shoplifting Site is it is sending off my personal details. Okay, there's my name, Mr. John Smith, and my customer ID. And it is sending this off in a parameter it calls cookies. Basically, these are the cookies that my browser has access to with client-side scripting. And we can see that if we have a look at the edit this cookie add-on. And in fact, what we can see here is we have one cookie that is called my customer ID. And the reason the client script is able to access this is that it's not flagged as HTTP only. So when a cookie is flagged as HTTP only, the server can read the cookie, but the client cannot. So certainly client script cannot. We can see it with add-ons such as edit this cookie, but I can't use JavaScript to access it. That's when it's flagged as HTTP only, but it's not, so JavaScript can access it. My personal details, same deal, not flagged as HTTP only. The only reason we wouldn't flag it as not HTTP only is if JavaScript needs to read it. And in many cases, it doesn't need to read it, but it's not flagged. Therefore, it is vulnerable to script being injected into the page and reading it. Now, we've got one cookie here that is flagged as HTTP only, and that's the ASP.NET session ID. And this is by default from Microsoft. You can't override it. Uh, that protects the session. So the actual session ID itself cannot be read by client-side scripting. Now, of course, if you implement your own session persistence or if you implement your own authentication and you implement your own authentication cookies and you don't flag them as HTTP only, then you've got a problem. So that was the way those cookies have been sniffed. So this was sort of example one of cross-site scripting. All we did was follow a link to a legitimate site and it siphoned off my cookies and it sent them off to an attacker. And anything of any sensitive nature in those cookies has gone off to the bad guys. So the other example I wanted to give, and there's a bit of a link down here, is this is another example of cross-site scripting which does this. So the logon form that you see here is not loaded from this website. The logon form that you see here is actually loaded from the cross-site scripting payload in the URL. Now, this looks legitimate and it looks enticing. Free shopping. Okay, everybody wants free shopping. All I've got to do is give them my username and my password. And of course, my password is going to be something like that. And it always in as little dots and little dots, of course, are secure. And we submit it. But the problem is, is that, hey, we're back here at Evil Shoplifting site. There's my username and there's the password I just entered. And the reason it was able to do this is again, some evil guy has been able to inject cross-site scripting into the URL, which has caused this login uh, to pop up. So let's take a little bit of a look at what happened in order for this to happen, or, or rather what the fault was in the app that allowed this to happen. And the first thing I'll do is let's just take a look at this other tab over here. And this is the cross-site scripting payload from the first example. Now, what happened here was this is a parameter for the website, legit param. Now, legit param could be anything. It could be, uh, hey, when someone goes to the site from an external site, there's a parameter pass for tracking of advertising click-throughs. Uh, it could be anything else that is normally used as a perfectly legitimate parameter on the website that exists in the query string and is rendered to the page. Every second website you look at will do this, every second web page. Very common, in and of itself, not a problem. 
But what's happened here is there's a starts with a quote and a semicolon, which is actually closing off a JavaScript statement. Okay, we're then constructing an XML HTTP object. Okay, we're then opening a connection to Evil Shoplifting site, and then we're sending that request, and then that quote is closing things off. So all this is is just very very basic JavaScript, which we've written and been able to execute on the site. So let's have a look at why this is able to happen. When we go across to the website, and this is our shop with robust security, all of this is on GitHub as well, so I'll provide the links so you can go and grab this off GitHub. So what's happening here is we have some JavaScript. And in this JavaScript, we are actually embedding a value from the query string. Now this is what we would call untrusted data. So when we say untrusted is that we don't have control over the source, we need to assume that it could be malicious, people could do nasty things with it. Unfortunately in this case what is happening is this query string is just being rendered directly to the page. And it's also being rendered into JavaScript. So what this means is, is that if you can inject a little bit of JavaScript into there, which might look just like that, it will execute without the need to add any script tags or things like that. And Things like script tags are generally a bit of a red flag for people that are trying to protect against uh, XSS. It just gets rendered into the browser, into the markup, uh, and it gets executed. Now what should really be happening, and this is really very basic, is we need to output encode. And output encode just says, look, before we put anything on the page, let's make sure that characters are escaped such that they can't actually execute in the browser. Now output encoding changes depending on the context. In this case it's going to JavaScript, so we want to encode for JavaScript. In ASP.NET we would use the anti-XSS framework, which we'll come back to in a moment. That's either an add-on pre.NET 4.5, it's a library from NuGet, uh, or .NET 4.5 has it baked in. So very, very easily accessible. Now, Jumping over to the code behind, there's a few things in here that are being done wrong. So the first thing that's being done wrong is when this cookie is created, this cookie is not set to HTTP only. So if we're not explicit about that, it's not going to create an HTTP only cookie. This is what we should have done. So this is really, really simple. If it had have been an HTTP only cookie, we couldn't have accessed it if we screwed up and we didn't have our cross-site scripting being properly uh, escaped. So that was the first thing. There's another cookie here, same problem. This cookie does not have any uh, HTTP only attribute. The other problem with both these cookies is they have a very, very far reaching expiration. Now far reaching expiration means on the one hand, okay, great, they'll stick around and they'll be accessible uh, many months into the future. So whatever process it was that set them doesn't necessarily have to run again, such as a logon. On the other hand, it means that you've got a very, very long window of opportunity to actually uh, attack someone's browser that does have these cookies in them. So there's a bit of a balancing act there, but certainly long reaching cookies do introduce a risk. So I showed you before we had an ASP.NET uh, session cookie and it was flagged as HTTP only. We had that session cookie because we added some data into the session. When we add data into the session, it creates a cookie. And again, it's always flagged as HTTP only. So it cannot be accessed by client script. Now, of course, it can be accessed via someone sniffing network traffic if you're not using HTTPS. And that is entirely feasible, and there are many precedents of that happening. So if you don't want someone to hijack your sessions, don't send it over HTTP. So getting on to our legit parameter, the thing that we really need to do here is we need to make sure that that parameter is first of all validated such that if it doesn't fall into an expected range of acceptable values, we're not going to use it. Now, hypothetically in this case, I'm happy for it to be uh, 0 through 9, lowercase a through lowercase z, uppercase a through uppercase z, alphanumeric. If I was validating this to make sure that it was only alphanumeric, then we would be okay. We could bail out just here because we could say, hey, it's not alphanumeric. Let's get out of here because it's not conforming to the structure that we expect. Now, of course, sometimes regexes are going to get a little bit more complex, but the fact that I was able to pass through everything from percentages to quotes is what enabled this XSS to be executed. So the other thing we're seeing here is the sort of security in layers. So little bits and little bits and little bits kept getting missed, and then they all sort of combined up into one big ball 
and we exploited it. Now the final thing here is that you'll see lots of different uh, encoding contexts. So I mentioned before uh, output encoding for the JavaScript context. When we output encode, we need to output encode for the context that the string is going to be rendered. And there are lots of different contexts. So there is HTML, HTML attributes, HTML form URLs, CSS, JavaScript, and on and on and on and on. And it's really important that you get the right encoding for the right context. Now what correct encoding looks like is if we go back and we look at the source code of this page, and we go down a little bit. So this is what was actually rendered into the code. And we can see here we've got our evil shoplifting site. And this string looks pretty much like what we had in the URL. This is JavaScript encoded strings. And you can see lots and lots of escape characters in here. And that's what it should look like in JavaScript. It means that that would be treated as a string and it would be accessible via client side script, but it wouldn't be executed in the browser. And that is a really, really critical differentiator. Now, of course, if you were whitelisting, you would make sure that this wasn't saved anyway, because really it's got a whole bunch of characters and other stuff in there that you don't want people submitting. So let's just close that guy down, close that guy down. Now, that's pretty much the vulnerabilities I wanted to demonstrate. And the way I wanted to close this out is earlier on I sent that tweet. And what I wanted to demonstrate was that it is easy to socially engineer people into following links that have a cross-site scripting payload. If your website has a cross-site scripting vulnerability, you need to expect people will come there with socially engineered payloads. And let's see how we've gone clickwise and see if we've got some people. Okay. Now I've got some followers, but you know, 110 clicks in the space of, I don't know, that's probably about 10 minutes is pretty easy. And on Twitter, I think I've got about 3,300 followers or something like that. If you actually had a serious number of followers, okay, like 623,000, and you were, how shall we say, infamous for doing this sort of thing, you could do some serious damage. So a couple of other final things on cross-site scripting. And one of the things I wanted to draw attention to, just in terms of prevalence, uh, White Hat Security had a report that they released uh, just last week, which found that about 55% of websites have vulnerabilities, uh, XSS vulnerabilities. And in fact, it's now their most prevalent, uh, prevalently seen X, um, security risk. So cross-site scripting is extremely prevalent. And as we just saw, it can also be extremely serious. It is serious enough that OWASP uh, do include it in their top 10. It is number two in their top 10. They do treat it very seriously. It's straight after SQL injection. Um, and if you know what you can do with SQL injection, you'll know that that is a, a particularly nasty attack vector. So cross-site scripting rates pretty highly with OWASP. And then we move on to guys like Mozilla as well. Now what folks like Mozilla are doing is they are offering bug bounties. And they're saying, hey, look, if you find cross-site scripting in our sites, we want to know about it. We will pay you money if you tell us about it. Now, I don't think most people expect to be paid money if they report a simple cross-site scripting vulnerability, but it is an indication of the severity of the risk. And it's the same sort of thing with Facebook. So Facebook obviously take cross-site scripting very seriously as well. This is not some frivolous little vulnerability that no one cares about. It is a serious risk. And when you have it, you got to turn around and get this thing fixed as fast as you possibly can. So again, just to wrap up, this is not meant to be directly reflective of Tesco's site. There are things I showed you that certainly they don't have risks on or probably don't have risks on. I don't know. I haven't gone through and looked at the whole thing. Uh, but it is an indication that you do need to take cross-site scripting seriously. If you do have a vulnerability, particularly if someone reports it, fix it. Because if it does get exploited, people can do pretty nasty things.